So hello, everyone, and welcome. I'd like to thank you all for coming today. Uh, my name is April Bellafiori, <coughs> and I'm just going to help MC for today. As you can see, we have Mr. O'Brien here with us through the magic of technology. And we actually have New Bedford and Attleboro on the line as well. So we're going to give uh, you from all three sites the ability to ask some questions a little bit later on. And what we'll be doing is providing Mr. O'Brien an opportunity to speak with you and to read an excerpt. And then we'll open it up for questions. Uh, and what we'll do is we'll start here in Fall River for questions. Then we'll move to New Bedford and Attleboro to give everyone an opportunity to speak. Um, what we'll do in the meantime is we will be muting the mics on all three ends so that we can hear him nice and clearly. And then we'll open the mics up at each end uh, so that we're able to answer or ask questions. The only other thing I would ask is that if everyone could just make sure that their cell phones are to silent or to vibrate or set to off, that would be appreciated. And I'm going to now turn it over to Connie, who will do the introductions. So thank you. Thank you, April. Good morning. My name is Connie Trepania, and I am a member of the One Book Committee. Our guest speaker today is the author of our one book, The Things They Carried, Mr. Tim O'Brien. This event has been funded by BCC's Veterans Success Grant through the Department of Labor, and we would like to thank them as well as our technology team for making this exciting opportunity to meet the author of our one book possible. It is most certainly a privilege for me to have been asked by the committee to introduce Mr. O'Brien today. I first read the things they carried some 10 years ago in Professor Bill Kelly's English Lit class, and I read it, well, because I had to. War stories are not my <laughs> usual read, and I approached it with caution. I will tell you that the book moved me. It moved me then, and when I reread it recently for this project, I discovered that it still has the power to move me. It is a very powerful book. Author Tim O'Brien has received numerous prestigious awards for his books and short stories, among them the National Book Award. In 2005, The Things They Carried was named by the New York Times as one of the 20 best books of the last quarter <laughs> century. It received the Chicago received Tribune Hotland Award in Fiction and was a finalist for both the Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Critics Circle Award. His short fiction has appeared in a host of prominent magazines and his novels have been translated into more than 20 languages. He will be speaking to us today via the magic of technology from his home in Austin, Texas, where he holds a chair in creative writing at Texas State University. So without further ado, please welcome the author of The Things They Carried, Mr. Tim O'Brien. Well, hello, it's great to be here. I hope you can all hear me. This is an odd, odd way to be talking to you, but I'll do my best. Uh, I want to start first by saying that I'd wanted to be a writer from the time I was a little boy, seven or maybe eight years old. And as much as Vietnam was important to my writing, I think my childhood was probably more important. Uh, I remember an image from my youth. I was probably six years old, maybe seven years old. And the images of my dad reading a book in our living room. He was seated, you know, sitting in, a, in an easy chair. And behind him there was a lamp on. It was approaching dusk. And the look in my dad's eyes as he read that book, the, the rapture and the delight and the contentment he felt as he, he was reading whatever book it was, uh, has stayed with me all these years. I remember looking at my dad as he read that book, thinking to myself how much I wished I were that book, so that he would look at me with the same delight and happiness uh, that he was looking at that book. I wanted to be the book, 
And I think that memory from my youth uh, had a lot to do with my desire as I got older and went through elementary school and junior high school and high school and college. That memory stayed with me and it made me want to be a writer. I wrote a little bit as a kid, not a lot, but now and then I would try to write a short story or portions of a short story. And I did this all through my elementary school years and through my junior high and high school years. But it wasn't really until Vietnam collided with this desire to be a writer that I began writing seriously. In Vietnam, I began writing at night or then the, maybe the hour before night when we'd sit at our foxholes waiting for dark to come on. Most of the guys would horse around and tell stories about home. But I would sit at my foxhole and write little vignettes about what had happened that day or the day before. Stories about my friends, about what I'd seen and what I had done. I remember an event in Vietnam that, that really pushed me over the edge to considering being a serious full-time professional writer. One day in July 1969, I found myself at the bottom of an irrigation ditch filled with slime and algae and the stink of decay, surrounded by gunfire, hearing the sounds of people screaming, people dying, not just Americans, but Vietnamese as well. And somewhere at the bottom of that irrigation ditch, as I writhed in horror and terror. I felt this overwhelming desire to someday, if I survive this nightmare, to testify about it, to bear witness, to tell people about what I had gone through and what my friends had gone through and what the Vietnamese were going through. The overwhelming nastiness of war. War is not the sanitary thing that, that uh, we are that's presented on CNN or the Fox Channel, where you get a little eight-minute or four-minute clip of the war. Uh, it's, it's nasty in all kinds of ways, not just the bombs and the bullets and the stuff you'd expect, but in just the da daily realities of uh, combat, kicking around civilians and you know, trampling down their rice paddies and burning villages and interrogating detainees. Uh, it's, war is like a kind of crank case oil that begins to seep inside you, this black, sinful sludge that's with you day and night, not just in the middle of firefights and not just in the standard combat situations, but it's inside you and you're carrying it along with you. Uh, uh, in Vietnam, I learned a few lessons, not many, but a few, that I thought I'd just talk about for a couple of minutes before reading a passage from the book. I learned, for example, that courage is not just physical, that there's a moral dimension to courage as well. The ability to say no when bad things are being done, or you're asked to do bad things. Beat up a civilian, burn down a, a, a someone's house. That with all the peer pressures that we're all familiar with, they're multiplied in, in a war setting where life and death is at stake. And it's difficult to just utter the word no. I won't do it. Uh, it's illegal. It's a war crime. I'm, I'm going to say no. Another example of where courage is not the standard thing we think of, kind of her heroism under fire, is that I found in Vietnam that just to keep walking was the bravest thing that I could do. Because you see, in Vietnam, 90% of our casualties came from landmines. And you couldn't find them, you couldn't see them, they, they just blew you up. And what we did as combat soldiers in Vietnam, as soldiers are now doing in Iraq and Afghanistan, is you're spending your days and some of your nights walking, not knowing if your next step will be the step that blows off your legs and your arms and blinds you or kills you. And to look down at your legs and see them still moving, almost on automatic, is a kind of courage that, to me at least, was 
surprising. It went beyond what I had expected. Another lesson I learned in Vietnam was this, that if you support a war with your mouth and your rhetoric, go to it. Don't just talk about it, how you know great it is to be at war. Go and send your daughter or your brother or your sister or your dad or your mom. Put your blood where your rhetoric is. Uh, it, for all of us as combat veterans, uh, wh whatever your politics, it's not a Democrat or Republican issue. It's an issue of basic humanity. Uh, I find it very hypo you know, hypocritical when I see talking heads on television supporting wars, but they're talking about it from the safety of their TV studios and their cute bow ties and neckties, uh, utterly safe from the consequences and the nastiness of war that I talked about a minute ago. Uh, these include politicians and journalists, but they also include well, the, the old man in Dubuque, Iowa, or in uh, Warwick, Rhode Island, whose uh, rhetoric is for the war, but he's, his rhetoric is uh, being uttered in the safety of his living room. Another lesson I think I learned in Vietnam was that a bullet can kill the enemy. That's for sure. But a bullet can also manufacture the enemy. It can make, it make an enemy. If that bullet strikes a little boy, you've got one very angry dad and mom and brother and sister and neighbor and friend and uncle and aunt. Bullets can kill the enemy, but they can manufacture or make an enemy as well. And that goes for bombs and all the other paraphernalia of war. What I'm saying is that we have to be careful that, that when we do go to war, that it's going to have the, the come to the conclusion that we want. And sometimes it just does not work that way. In Vietnam, I learned as I went into a village, the village might have been indifferent to the war, you know, and it might have even been friendly toward Americans. But when we left that village with their houses burning and their rice paddies trampled and their old people kicked around and, and uh, slapped and so on, we left and we left a, left a village that was no longer indifferent. They were uh, against us, which would happen in your own community. If a bunch of foreign soldiers came in and started burning down your houses and kicking you around, you're not going to be their friends anymore either. It's not an issue of politics. It's an issue of basic common sense and humanity. So, yeah, a bullet can kill the enemy, but a bullet can also make the enemy. Another little lesson I learned in Vietnam the hard way was that the standard heroic narrative of war that we're all familiar with and comes to us really basically from World War II in most of our memories is only partly reflective of the truth. Yes, there is a, a, a heroic dimension to war. Guys do brave things. Women do brave things. But there's also, a, as I said earlier, a nasty, mean-spirited component to it all where a man may do something very brave and heroic one moment and be doing something very unheroic and, and uh, nasty the next moment. Another little thing I think I brought home with me from Vietnam that I hope is reflected in the things they carried is that one sense of truth gets undermined by a war. Things you took for granted that's just absolutely true gets changed forever by what happens in a war. It happened to me um, right away. I was brought up in a small town in southern Minnesota. I was taught by my Methodist minister, thou shalt not kill. And then I got to Vietnam, where my company commander was telling me you'd better kill. If you don't, we'll court-martial you. Well, what's true? Is it the minister back in Minnesota? Or is it the company commander in Vietnam? Can they both be telling the truth? How so? They seem utterly contradictory. That explains, I hope, in part, why the book is written the way it is, that blur between what's real and what's not real, and uh, the, the blur between reality and fiction in the book. 
in all kinds of ways, it seems to me, one's sense of yourself gets undermined by a war. Who am I? Am I that nice little boy growing up in southern Minnesota? Or am I, in the, am I this guy walking around doing these nasty things in Vietnam? So truth gets undermined. Um, I had said I would talk for about uh, eight or nine or minutes and, uh, I, and then begin reading. And I want to leave plenty of time for questions. So what I want to do now is read a small section from the things they carried with the hope that some of the things I just talked about will find their reflection in what I'm reading. We crossed the river and marched west into the mountains. On the third day, Kurt Lemon stepped on a booby-trapped 105 artillery round. He was playing catch with Rat Kylie, laughing, and then he was dead. The trees were thick, and it took nearly an hour to cut an LZ for the dust off. Later, higher in the mountains, we came across a baby VC water buffalo. What it was doing there, I don't know. No farms or paddies. But we chased it down and got a rope around it and led it along to a deserted village where we set up for the night. After supper, Rat Kylie went over and stroked the baby water buffalo's nose. He opened up a can of sea rations, pork and beans, but the baby buffalo wasn't interested. Rat shrugged. He stepped back and shot it through the right front knee. The animal did not make a sound. It went down hard and then got up again. And Rat took careful aim and shot off an ear. He shot it in the hindquarters and in the little hump at its back. He shot it twice in the flanks. It wasn't to kill. It was to hurt. He put the rifle muzzle up against the mouth and shot the mouth away. Nobody said much. The whole platoon was there, standing in a uh, small circle, feeling all kinds of things. But there was not a great deal of pity for that baby water buffalo. Kurt Lemon was dead. Rat Kylie had lost his best friend in the world. Later in the week, Rat would write a long personal letter to the guy's sister who would not write back. But for now, it was a question of pain. Rat shot off the tail. He shot away chunks of meat below the ribs. All around us, there was the smell of smoke and filth and deep greenery. And the evening was humid and very hot. And Rat Kiley went to automatic. He shot randomly, almost casually quick little spurts in the belly and butt. Then he reloaded, squatted down, and shot the baby buffalo in the left front knee. Again, the animal fell hard and tried to get up, but this time it couldn't quite make it. It wobbled and went down sideways. Rat shot it in the nose. He bent forward and whispered something as if talking to a pet, and then he shot it in the throat. All the while, the baby buffalo was silent, or almost silent, just a light bubbling sound where the nose had been. It lay very still. Nothing moved except the eyes, which were enormous, the pupils shiny black and dumb. Rat Kylie was crying. He tried to say something, but then he cradled his rifle and went off by himself. The rest of us stood in a ragged circle around the baby buffalo. For a time, no one spoke. We had witnessed something essential, something brand new and profound, a piece of the world so startling there was not yet a name for it. Somebody kicked the baby buffalo. It was still alive, though just barely, just in the eyes. Amazing, Dave Jensen said. My whole life, never seen anything like it. Never? 
Not hardly, not once. Kiowa and Mitchell Sanders picked up the baby buffalo. They hauled it across the open square, hoisted it up, and dumped it in the village well. Afterward, we sat waiting for Rat to get himself together. Amazing, Dave Benson kept saying. A new wrinkle. I've never seen it before. Mitchell Sanders took out his yo-yo. Well, that's Nam, he said. Garden of evil. Over here, man, every sin's real fresh and original. How do you generalize? War is hell, but that's not the half of it. Because war is also mystery and terror and adventure and courage and discovery and holiness and pity and despair and longing and love. War is nasty. War is fun. War is thrilling. War is drudgery. War makes you a man. War makes you dead. The truths are contradictory. It can be argued, for instance, that war is grotesque. But, in truth, war is also beauty. For all its horror, you cannot help but gape at the awful majesty of combat. You stare at tracer rounds unwinding through the dark like brilliant red ribbons. You crouch in ambush as a cool, impassive moon rises over the nighttime patties. You admire the fluid symmetries of troops on the move, the harmonies of sound and shape and proportion, the great sheets of metal fire streaming down from a gunship, the illumination rounds, the white phosphorus, the purpley-orange glow of napalm, the rocket's red glare. It's not pretty, exactly. It's astonishing. It fills the eye. It commands you. You hate it, yes, but your eyes do not. Like a killer forest fire, like cancer under a microscope, any battle or bombing raid or artillery barrage has the aesthetic purity of absolute moral indifference, a powerful, implacable beauty. And a true war story will tell the truth about this, though the truth is ugly. To generalize about war is like generalizing about peace. Almost everything is true. Almost nothing is true. At its core, perhaps, war is just another name for death. And yet, any soldier will tell you, if he tells the truth, that proximity to death brings with it a corresponding proximity to life. After a firefight, there's always the immense pleasure of aliveness. The trees are alive, the grass, the soil, everything. All around you, things are purely living, and you among them. And the aliveness makes you tremble. You feel an intense, out-of-the-skin awareness of your own living self, your truest self, the human being you want to be and then become by the force of wanting it. In the midst of evil, you want to be a good man. You want decency. You want justice and courtesy and human concord, the things you never knew you wanted. There is a kind of largeness to it, a kind of godliness. Though it's odd, you're never more alive than when you're almost dead. You recognize what's valuable. Freshly, as if for the first time, you love what is best in yourself and in the world, all that might be lost. At the hour of dusk, you sit at your foxhole and look out on a wide river turning pinkish red, and at the mountains beyond. And although in the morning you must cross the river and go into the mountains and do terrible things and maybe die, even so, you find yourself studying the fine colors on the river. You are filled with a hard, aching love for how the world could be and should be, but now is not. Mitchell Sanders was right. 
For the common soldier, at least, war has the feel, the spiritual texture of a great ghostly fog, thick and permanent. There is no clarity, everything swirls. The old rules are no longer binding. The old truths no longer true. Right spills over into wrong, order blends into chaos, love into hate, ugliness into beauty, law into anarchy, civility into savagery. The vapors suck you in. You can't tell where you are or why you're there. And the only certainty is overwhelming ambiguity. In war, you lose your sense of the definite, hence your sense of truth itself. And therefore, it's safe to say that in a true war story, nothing is ever absolutely true. Okay, I'm done talking now, and it's time to uh, do what I enjoy the most, which is uh, question and answer stuff, and I'll do my best to respond to your questions. I can hear. All right. Uh, hello, Mr. Brian, uh, Mr. O'Brien. My name is Tyrone Smith. Uh, my question to you is, I imagine when you began the writing process, uh, you had to relive a lot of this stuff. Um, can you elaborate on that? And uh, if so, how did you overcome that? Uh, that's a great question. When I began writing about it, I, I had never taken writing classes. Um, I'd read a lot of books during my life, of course. I loved, as I mentioned when I first started, I loved reading from the time I was a little kid. And I think that when I began writing, what I mostly was doing was listening in my head to what I'd read in the past. So when I'd write a sentence, I would, I would, I would be able to hear whether it had a sound of, of uh, beauty to it, whether it had a grace, gracefulness and so on. Uh, I think that's basically how most writers begin. You begin with the books you've read. They swirl around in your head, kind of like ghosts. And you soak up through your reading ways of storytelling and how to tell stories. Um, I was, I, I, I'm a writer who appreciates a good, sharp story. I need to see things happening and I need to have a sense of tension. Uh, I need to have a sense of clarity. What in images, I want to be able to see things vividly. Those are the kind of books I, I like to read and though that's, therefore I try to write that way. In the section I just read to you with the shooting of the baby water buffalo, I tried to be very precise with my language so that you'd be able to see that poor baby buffalo, the gobs of flesh jumping off its flanks and the hump at its back and an ear being blown away and a bubbling sound with the nose had been. Uh, this goes back to what I had said earlier when I was talking about that irrigation ditch that I found myself in, that I was determined that I was going to let America see the war that I was in through my writing. I was just <laughs> determined. Uh, America has a way of, of sanitizing its wars. We sort of sprinkle Ajax on them on the 4th of July and on Veterans Day. Everything's very sanitary. And you don't see the, the horror of it all. And I was determined having found myself in that irrigation ditch, you know, just covered with algae and leeches and slime and people dying all around me, that I wanted America to, to uh, actually see the war and in a, in, not in a sanitized kind of way. Let's 
other questions? Okay, we have one all the way up at the top. Ms. O'Brien, my name is Bill Kelly. I teach uh, writing and literature here. I was wondering, um, since uh, I'm presuming that uh, drafts of this you wrote as early as the 1980s, um, how different you felt reading it today? Does it have any more significance now, uh, looking back with a, um, a, a certain memory now versus when you originally wrote it? Um, I, the, that question was kind of blurry. Can, some, can the MC please repeat it so I can hear it more clearly? I can try it again. Can you hear me? You're kind of going in and out, but I'll uh -oh. give it a shot. Is that better? That's better. People around here normally don't have trouble hearing me, so. <laughs> I assume that you had originally written this in draft, perhaps in the, the 1980s, and I was wondering what your reaction was now reading it some years later. Um, ha have your um, oh. attitudes about it changed? That's a great question. It was actually published in 1990, so it's not qu I'm not quite that old yet. But it's uh, still, 20, a book is 21 years old now. And it, in some ways, my attitudes toward the book have changed. In other ways, they haven't. Uh, the wars in Afghanistan and in Iraq have both, uh, for me at least, validated what I had written all those years ago. It, it feels as if what was true back during my time in Vietnam is just as true for soldiers today as it was back then. Uh, what our men and women are experiencing in Afghanistan is very similar to what we experienced in combat in Vietnam. Who's your enemy? Who do you shoot at? There are no uniforms, there's no front, there's no rear, there are no safe areas, or if they're safe areas, they're only marginally safe. Uh, you go out into the field and you don't know who your enemy is until you're being shot at, and then it's too late. And this, this truth that was uh, at the core of the things they carried in many ways, I find is equally true in talking to uh, returning veterans of our wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, both our, so, both all three of these wars, Iraq, Afghanistan, and, uh, and Vietnam, are civil wars in which it's hard to distinguish friends from enemies. Another thing is that back in Vietnam, as I mentioned, 90% of our casualties in my unit uh, were from landmines. Well, it's pretty similar today in Afghanistan and Iraq. I don't know the exact numbers, but I do know that many, 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 many uh, uh, of our soldiers are being uh, killed and wounded by these inanimate objects planted in the ground. They call them IEDs today, but it's the same thing. Uh, well, how do you shoot back at a, at a landmine? It's already dead. You can't kill it. It's, an, it's this object in the ground. And as a result of all these uncertainties, who's your enemy? How do you shoot back at a landmine? Who's for you? Who's against you? A kind of frustration builds up inside a soldier. And the frustration turns into sometimes into anger. And the anger finds its outlets. You begin taking out your anger on civilians, and the whole place becomes the enemy, since you can't find the enemy. And uh, it's that dynamic of, of uh, kind of building frustration and anger that's very similar to what I experienced uh, four decades ago in Vietnam. So in many ways, when I read the things they carried, I feel as if I'm reading at least in part about what's happening uh, in our present wars. I receive letters from, uh, from Iraq and from Afghanistan from the soldiers who are carrying around the things they carried with them. The book is one of the things they carry now, which is an odd irony. And I'm hearing, I'm hearing also about, you know, from their, their sisters and their wives and their children, letters uh, saying essentially the same thing. They'll say, my dad won't talk about it or my husband won't talk about it. But at least in reading your book, I now have some kind of a sense of what they're going through. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Sure. We have another 
question. And then after this question, we'll move on to Attleboro. So if there's anyone in Attleboro who has a question, um, now would be a good time to be prepared. Oh, Ms. O'Brien, uh, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Okay, thank you. Thank you for uh, sharing your experiences with us. Uh, my name is Jack Pleasure. Sprague. I'm the president here at Bristol Community College and uh, uh, a C-130 pilot in Vietnam from 1965 to 1968. I'm sure I helped supply you in those difficult days and that difficult place in uh, July of 65. Uh, but my question uh, actually uh, goes beyond the war. Uh, the, one of the things that I carry uh, after the war uh, occurred on what should have been uh, my, the happiest day of that period for me, the day I landed back in Massachusetts, uh, uh, home finally and safe, thank God. But uh, uh, one of the most horrific sights for me uh, from the whole experience was that day at the airport when I was faced with my parents. Uh, coming and they had gotten old in those three years. Now, for various circumstances, I was three years over there instead of the the, the usual term. But uh, it was really quite a um, something. It's, it's probably my most vivid memory of the entire war and uh, what I still carry with me today. So my question to you is uh, not only uh, uh, if you'd care to share your personal experience about your family uh, uh, reaction when you were home but also the uh, things that you've heard from your comrades in arms about their families and whatnot. Uh, it, was, uh, it was quite a shock. It remains with me. It's something I'll never, uh, I'll always carry with me. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great, great comment and question that I remember, uh, just for those of, uh, in the audience who don't know the experience of coming back from a war, it's worth saying that I'll just give you my own, which I'm sure is similar to almost, you know, to yours and to, to almost all the veterans who returned from from war. Uh, it, it was it was like lightning. One minute I was at a forward fire base and in a, in you know great danger. Took a shower, got on a helicopter, went to Da Nang, got on an airplane, left Vietnam, all within the space of, I don't know, seven hours or so. I was flying out of the country. One minute in combat, the next on an airplane. An airplane that was just a, you know, a chartered airplane. It was full of you know, flight attendants and little, those little TV dinners they used to serve. The war was over. I landed in Japan, got on another airplane, and about, I don't know how many hours later, but 10 hours later or whatever, I landed in, in a uh, Fort Lewis, Washington, the Tacoma, said the Pledge of Allegiance, got a haircut, got on another airplane, and uh, flew off to my home in Minnesota. The, a, a total of a, probably about a day had gone by, about 24 hours, from the time I was in combat to the time I was over the, over the, in the skies over North Dakota, heading for Minnesota. I went to the back of the airplane, went into the bathroom there, took off my uniform, put on the, a hat, as you see here, and a sweater, blue jeans, and the war was over. When I landed, it was, it was that fast. Uh, my mom and dad were there to meet me. I was there only a year, unlike you, which was three years. But nonetheless, the whole world had changed for me. Uh, they, they, there was a, there, there were, my mom and dad were silent about the war. They didn't want to ask me questions, and I didn't much want to talk about it. Like a lot of veterans, I didn't know what to say or where to start. I was just elated to be alive and to be home. The whole country had changed, not just my parents. The, the, it, during the year that I was in Vietnam, 1969 to 1970, a whole revolution had happened in this country. The women's lib movement had happened. Uh, the, the yippies were out on the street, Abby Hoffman and Jerry Rubin. The dissension against the war had multiplied from the time I had left to when I got back. It was like trying to adjust, in a way, to a new culture and a new, new language and a new way of being in the world. Um, so the, the, the adjustment was not just to peacetime. The adjustment was also to how the world changes when you're away from it. Uh, for even a year, in my case, it was a—it felt like I was entering a, as if I were Rip Van Winkle, waking up after being asleep for a year and seeing a, a new, new country, new TV programs, 
new movie stars, uh, new headlines, uh, all, all of it brand new as if I just awakened from a long sleep? It's a great question. You mentioned in your writing uh, something that sounded uh, very almost shocking. It, it was like a bitter irony when you stated that war is beautiful and you were referring to the visual uh, stimulus at that time. I was wondering if you could expand on that a little bit, that statement that war is bit, uh, beautiful, that kind of bitter irony. Were there other ways? Um, for example, in your writing, you write about the, the camaraderie, the relationships between um, you and the other uh, troops. And um, it, it's, it almost sounds beautiful sometimes when you're talking about the death of someone or how people reacted to the death of their, their comrade. And I was wondering if you could expand on that in relation to War is Beautiful. In what way do you yeah, mean? It's a, it's a, that's a great question, and it's, a very, it's very hard to talk about. I'm an anti-war kind of guy. I think you, have to, you should have really good reasons to go off killing people. They ought to, they ought to, if you're going to go off to get rid of weapons of mass destruction, there better be weapons of mass destruction to get rid of. And if there aren't, you ought to be, begin questioning your government and yourself and your country. It would be as if Pearl Harbor hadn't happened. Well, what would my dad have said as a sailor out in the South Pacific if suddenly there came a report, oh, there was no attack in Pearl Harbor. It was, you know, it never happened. So I want to be clear when I begin talking about your question that I'm not, I don't mean this to be, you know, uh, a, as a motive to go to war. On the other hand, I've got to be honest about the world as I witnessed it. As much as I do despise uh, war, as we all should. It's like, just like despising death, I guess, or murder. Uh, nonetheless, when you're in combat, you're out on, a, say, a late-night ambush, and up above you there's this round, cool moon, and the clouds moving, and the slosh of paddy water under your boots, and there's, a, there's an electric sense of aliveness to it all. Even though you're terrified out of your mind that you may soon die, or you a friend may die, you're nonetheless hypnotized in a way by your awareness of this living world all around you, the moon and the water, what's lurking out there in the dark, that, that is spellbinding and is one of the attractions, I think, that bring men and sometimes women to go off uh, seeking danger. There's the... the, the, the the, there's a, feel, a tingling feel of an electric world around you because you're so close to dying. You're aware of everything around you, your own breathing. You're aware of how much you love a Big Mac because you don't have one, and clean water to drink as opposed to patty water, and a good cold Coca-Cola when there is no vending machine nearby in those rice patties. You're aware of all these things, your mom and dad, your hometown, the things you never knew you valued so much, that has a, an element of beauty to it, that you're, you're aware of the beauties of the world because you may soon die and lose those beauties. And there's an attraction about all of that that I think is undeniable. I think it's part of what has, through the, the millennia, ha, has drawn human beings uh, off to fight. Uh, and uh, to go into combat. I might add, just as another, I just remembered another part of your question. I, so I should add that the, the relationships between fellow soldiers, there's also a beauty there that you, you, in, in, in a war setting, it's not just having a buddy. It's, ha it's having a buddy who's <coughs> keeping you alive, who's got your back, who's not falling asleep at night on guard who's uh, doing his, his job well, 
because if he doesn't do it well, it might kill you. And uh, there, so a kind of fraternity and, and respect and even love develops among fellow soldiers that carries over to this day. Among my company, my infantry company, we're now back in combat and back in contact, not in combat, but in contact after all these, uh, after all these years through emails. And there's still that sense of, of having been through something together uh, that's beyond the normal friendship. Are you there? Do we have another question? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Um, okay, so my name is Matt and I'm studying history. And uh, one of my favorite movies is uh, Apocalypse Now, which really uh, focuses a lot on the uh, psychological aspects of the war. And one of the uh, most vivid scenes for me uh, is uh, sort of very similar to uh, the, st uh, the uh, section of the book that you read, uh, which is why I thought of it, where um, they encounter some uh, just innocent civilians on a boat going down the river. and. Uh, it seems like they're trying to protect something, so they kill them all, and the main character has no remorse about it. And um, I'm thinking, have you ever seen the movie, and uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I have seen the movie, and I think it's brilliant. Uh, it captures, unlike a lot of the bad war movies I've seen, and there are plenty of them, it ca the apocalypse now captures a sense of the absurdity of, of what, I, what was at the heart of Vietnam for me. When I spoke earlier about how everything gets turned upside down in a war, thou shalt not kill, now you gotta kill, or they'll court-martial you. Where what before you thought was good about yourself, you're not so sure about anymore. I'm not that person I thought I was all those years ago. I'm capable of great evil uh, in the name of in the name of uh, you know self-defense. And that movie I thought captured that upside down Alice in Wonderland hobbity feeling of war. In, in so many ways. The, uh, it also captures that sense I was talking about earlier of, of the nastiness of war, that scene you just mentioned. is certainly a nasty scene. It's not a combat scene. It's a, it's a murder scene. It's somebody killing innocent people. And uh, that's, that is not just Vietnam for you. That's war for you. If you if you if you think that the people who die in wars are just soldier versus soldier in some kind of sterile environment, you're living in a dreamland. Civilians die. People, soldiers don't shoot straight, and soldiers get angry. Uh, soldiers get scared, and as a consequence, they're going to be they're going to be non-combatant uh, deaths. And it's, it's a given of war. One can even go back to the Iliad and the Odyssey and see exactly the same phenomenon. It's not a sterile thing. And Apocalypse Now, and I hope my own book, to, to help, help to remind us of, of the, uh, this, this sinful spillage that of, uh, of, uh, of horror that, that, that we call war. War, when you use the word, sounds so abstract that it, it, it's almost meaningless. And one of the values of a, of a work of fiction or of a good movie or of art in general is to bring us back to basics and to remind us of the realities of war and not this Fourth of July, this Veterans Day, pot-bellied nostalgia that we often get. That's total, it's totally heroic. You know, we're wrapping ourselves in the red, white, and blue and clapping ourselves on the back for how we're heroes and how good we are. There's some truth in that, but that it's not that's not all the truth. The truth is also has an ugly component. How about one more question from Attleboro and now we'll move to you, Bedford. Hi, Mr. O'Brien. Uh, my name is Lisa Victor and I'm the I'm the librarian here at the um, uh, at this school and uh, at this campus. I, I have kind of a comment and then a question. Um, my, uh, my dad was a Marine on the South Pacific on the Portland, and I recall that he 
was never wanting to talk much about his experience in World War II, but when he reconnected with his um, fellow uh, soldiers and in these reunions that they would go to, I know that he valued that time with them very much. And, um, and I was thinking about the story of Norman Bowker when Norman Bowker went home and how he wanted to tell his story uh, and yet nobody wanted to know. Nobody was ready. And I wanted to know if you could speak to the comment that you made earlier about you at, 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 in the beginning, you weren't ready to talk about your experiences, and yet also a very real comment that the country wasn't ready to hear these stories either, and maybe that was also a part of the, a sign of the times. Um, is, is that a cohesive enough comment and question for you? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, there are two components to human communication. One is talking and one of the other is listening. And you need to have both to have communication. People have to be able to have words come out of their mouth, and other people have to have those words come into their ears and hearts and minds. And it takes both. I found that I was very reluctant, as most veterans of most wars are, to uh, talk about the war. I don't do it in my ordinary life. I don't walk around this house and, you know, say Vietnam stuff. I'm, I don't do it, and most veterans don't. It's not just out of, for psychological reasons that people don't talk about wars. It's, be, it's because you're overwhelmed by your own experience. You don't know where to begin. If somebody says, well, what was the war like? You don't know where to start. And I felt that very same pressure just now in, when I began talking to you at the beginning of our time together. What do I say? And there's so much to cover. And it, and it makes you fall silent because it's so overwhelming. Another reason that it's hard to talk about a war is simple politeness. That it's You don't walk into a bar and say, hey, do you want to hear about Nam? People are going to get out of that bar in a hurry because they don't want to. Uh, it's not appropriate. And as a combat veteran, you don't know when it is appropriate to begin talking. And uh, there, so that's one element of it. But the other element is you're also uncertain as to whether people want to hear anything or not whether they're interested in the subject and care about it. And so that's another thing that keeps you silent. I had a, I had a letter from a young woman in, uh, from my home state in Minnesota. She was a 26-year-old elementary school teacher who wrote me a letter about two years ago. And she said, I've been meaning to write you for a long time, but now I feel I really have to write you. She said that as a kid growing up in Minnesota, uh, she was aware that her father had been in Vietnam as a soldier. She had found some of his medals under a bed, and she'd seen his uniform hanging in a closet. But she said, my dad never talked about the war uh, to me, to my brother, or to my mother. He just went stone silent. And she said the stone silence lasted all through her junior high school years at the dinner table a kind of tension was always there that got worse and worse the older she got. There began to develop marital problems between her father and her mother because of the silence. The guy just wouldn't talk. And uh, at one point, she said in her letter to me that I began to feel more like a daughter than, a, rather more like a counselor than a daughter, trying to help their parents' marriage stay together because of this silence. Uh, she said at one point her mother uh, confessed to her that she had never loved her, this woman, this girl's father. And the girl said, you never, you never loved my dad? And the mother said, well, how could I? He doesn't talk to me. He doesn't tell, he's got all these secrets buried in his past. How can you love somebody? I, I want to help him and I, I like him, but it's not love anymore. And I don't think it ever was, the mother said. And then the, this 26-year-old elementary school teacher writes that in, at some point in her high school years, either her junior or senior year in high school, in an AP English class, she was assigned the things they carried. And she brought it home, and she gave it to her dad to read, who gave it to her mom. 
And um, at, the, at the dinner table, finally, a few syllables were uttered by the father, just a few words about, you know, what he'd gone through. And then the next night, a few more, and the next night, a few more, and then whole sentences. And pretty soon, some kind of storytelling communication was happening at the, that, that dinner table. Well, the, the elementary school teacher, now it's about 26, she's no longer a young girl, she writes, you know, my mom and dad aren't perfect, they still got problems, but they're together. And I don't think they would have been had it not been for that book, reaching that dinner table. And it's an example of a, of a, of a, I don't know, what, what literature and books can do. They're not just for English classes, and they're not just for analysis. They can also help people in their lives. They can do things that are way beyond what an author intends. I didn't intend to save that marriage or help it out. I just wanted to write a book that would be honest and, and thoughtful and aimed at the human heart. But sometimes books can go beyond the classroom and they can reach into people's lives in the most incredible kinds of ways, breaking that silence that we were just talking about. Uh, good morning, sir. My name is Cynthia Lushard. First of all, I want to thank you to share your story with us. Um, I have a comment and a question. My husband and I have been served uh, for 23 years in the Army, and we've been married for 17 years. He never said anything to me. Um, we talk about everything, but when it comes to the Army, he's silent. My question is, what makes you come out of your box? How long it, t it take you to come out? That's a great question, and there are two parts to my answer. The first part is that I haven't come out in some ways. That I don't, as I mentioned earlier, I don't. Many of my friends don't know I was, a, you know, in Vietnam. If they don't know I'm a writer out on the golf course or whatnot, I don't talk about Vietnam, playing golf, or you know, going to the grocery store. So many people I know uh, don't know I'm a veteran because I don't talk about it, and I'm still in that box in some ways. But the other part of my answer is goes back to that irrigation ditch I mentioned when we started here, that somewhere in that slime, listening to all those people dying all around me, I made a vow that I was going to talk. No matter how difficult it is and no matter what the personal pain that I might uh, have as a result, I was not going to be shut up. That America gave me Vietnam, I'm just giving it back. Here it is. Uh, if you don't like the profanity in the book, that's tough. If you, if you don't like the profanity, then watch how you vote when you go into voting booths, because you send guys to war, war is obscene, and they're going to be talking that kind of language when they come home. I'm not going to pretty up my books. Uh, when I give the war back to America and, you know, sanitize them and put on the Ajax, uh, you're getting it back the way I witnessed it. And if you don't like it, watch how you vote. You know, if you don't, and, but I'm not going to lie to you and have some guy say, oh, poop, I've been shot. The war is not that way. And uh, you're not going to hear that word in, in my books anyway. It's going to be said as, as bluntly as it was. So there are two parts. There's a tension that's always inside me. It's a tension between being quiet and silent and holding those memories inside as kind of secrets. But there's also this fierce desire that I have uh, to grab my country by the, by the lapels and, and speak as bluntly and truthfully about it as I can. Mindful of everyone's time, but we can't thank you enough for the time that you've spent with us this morning. Um, I have the mic unmuted, and I would like everyone just to say a big thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you.